Another harsh winter grips the small town of Altan Bulag in central Mongolia. Snow came early again this year, as in much of this vast country, bringing more hardship for its mainly nomadic population. Herding families dependent on their traditional winter pastures have had to move elsewhere. Extreme weather is the norm in this cold part of Asia, but it's harsh economic realities that may yet defeat its people. The grasslands they've used freely for centuries are to be privatized, the latest stage of Mongolia's journey from socialism to a free market economy. Oyensetseg is a semi-nomadic herder, one of the one and a quarter million people who live in traditional felt tents known as gers, relying on herding and livestock trading to survive. People like her make up 50% of Mongolia's population. Since the fall of communism and the rush towards a market economy, herds and cooperatives have been privatized. Oyen Setseg now owns her own herd, but she's lost the services that supported it. She no longer has free transport to market, subsidized winter hay, or a guaranteed water supply. Collective farms and factories have closed, and for a while, the agriculturally dependent economy collapsed. Loans from the International Monetary Fund have partially replaced Soviet subsidies, but small herders like Oyen Setseg have been hit hardest by the IMF's austerity measures. Privatization of the land itself will limit her mobility around traditional pasture land. In the capital, Ulaanbaatar, Western development specialists have flooded in to assist Mongolia's economic reform program. State assets like the country's entire, mostly coal-based energy system are now up for sale, along with Mongolia's other largest enterprises. The Ag Bank has just been privatized. It's Mongolia's biggest bank, the only financial institution with branches all over this vast country, making it particularly important to the rural population. Three years ago, it was millions of dollars in debt. Now it's begun offering loans to herders and access to cash in rural areas and is in profit after being turned around by a US consultancy. It's a Mongolian success story. The primary reason the Ag Bank uh, experiment has worked is uh, that it was set up to be independent from the government uh, by mutual agreement among the US government, uh, the World Bank, and the government of Mongolia. Uh, the bank was conveyed to an independent management team and to an independent board and operates without any interference uh, from the government. So we're able to clean up loans, make good loans, hire our own people, and not rely on this uh, non-transparent government activity which uh, plagued the bank in the past. Successive Mongolian governments have continued their support for economic reform. The re-election a few years ago of Mongolia's former Communist Party under the leadership of President Baganbadi may have worried some international donors, but the party's reaffirmed its commitment to the privatization process. Even so, it's a slow, painful transition for many Mongolians. The gap between town and country is growing and many are falling into poverty. International experts aiding Mongolia's economic reform program say privatization is a positive step forward. I think uh, it's Im important to bring in international um, um, expertise as well as capital and know-how um, in into Mongolia. Um, in 10 or 12 years, you can only do so much on your own. Uh, so I think the privatization process is um, highly positive and obviously to the extent their crown jewels sold, there's money coming into uh, in revenue in into the budget. So I think. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to do it. One of the jewels in Mongolia's crown is its Kashmir industry, dominated by the Gobi Corporation. Mongolia is the second largest Kashmir producer in the world after China. It's a big foreign currency earner. At its two factories in Ulaanbaatar, the Gobi Corporation processes and exports thousands of tons of fine wool supplied by Mongolia's goat herders. In the early 1990s, Gobi and other Mongolian Kashmir producers benefited from protective measures that kept their prices low, masking the company's need to modernize. Recently, though, economic reforms have exposed the industry to global competition. China's been buying up all of Mongolia's raw wool, paying prices Gobi cannot afford, and flooding the global market. 
Mongolia's cashmere industry is in the doldrums. When Gobi was put up for sale last year, there were no buyers. People who know the cashmere world are, of course, interested. But in the present economic situation, they do consider the risks. If markets would go up, it would be possible. For Mongolia's one and a half million goat herders, the choice is stark. Sell their raw cashmere to Mongolian companies and lose money, or sell to China and survive. Hardship amongst herders has also led them to breed goats producing inferior wool to maximize their income, adding to the industry's problems. Mongolia has extremely high quality cashmere, or could have. But in the last 10, 12 years, with the destitution in the countryside, uh, many herders reduce the quality of Kashmir but raise the quantity in order to barter with China. And they were in the initial period accepting even consumption goods from trade, Chinese traders in order to survive. So this has lowered their competitiveness in the world market. For the Mongolian government, the problems of its Kashmir industry have highlighted their country's new vulnerability to world markets. The world's current economic problems have hindered the privatization process. Right now, the downturn of the world economy has a negative impact on the privatization process of our most valued companies. Our ultimate goal is to attract foreign investment, but foreign companies have little interest in investing abroad at the moment because of the downturn of the world economy and the general investment situation. This all affects our work badly. Also taking its toll is a series of harsh winters, followed by summer droughts that have caused the deaths of 11 million animals over the past three years. It spelled disaster for Mongolia's herders. Many families have lost all their animals and their livelihoods. Under collectivization, state support would have prevented such a disaster. Now, herding patterns in the countryside are seen as economically and environmentally unsustainable, and herders are being encouraged to form cooperatives and develop alternative sources of income. As it swallows the painful medicine prescribed by international bankers, strategic thinking is also needed for Mongolia as a whole. Landlocked and bordered by the two huge economies of Russia and China, it can no longer rely on traditional strengths to survive. They are dependent on a very narrow economic base. They have essentially minerals, some livestock-related production, like Kashmir, and uh, not much else, perhaps tourism, but tourism that is squeezed into a very narrow window in the summer. The net result is the economic options are very limited for the people and for the government as a, as a whole. And they have to find niche markets that they can protect. Meanwhile, herders in towns like Altan Bulag face a future of chronic poverty. As Mongolia prepares to privatize land that's been crisscrossed by nomadic herders for centuries, many fear their way of life and privatization cannot work together. Having made the great leap from socialism towards modernization, Mongolia's challenge is to make market economics work for its relatively tiny population. For the moment, though, it remains the most aid-dependent nation in the world. <laughs>